praise the Lord, mighty prophet of the Lord. Well, uh, blessed listeners, uh, today I want to share a little bit more on this very, very important conversation of the Lord and the Church. The conversation that the Lord has gotten the nations, the nations of the earth to be caught up in. I shared with you uh, briefly yesterday, a little bit veiled, but briefly yesterday, on this very tremendous vision that the Lord has entrusted me with again at this hour. The vision the Lord showed me in this month of June and June 2nd, the year 2016. And yesterday I shared with you the first portion as the Lord enabled me and allowed me. And in that portion of that very, very important vision that has very, very important consequence and impact unto the nations of the earth, unto the church, unto Christian life. So, in that conversation I shared yesterday, you see that uh, I woke up in the morning of that June 2nd, and then I walked away, and as I sat there on the couch, the Lord then slayed me at that place, and I fell asleep on that couch. And in that morning, then the Lord immediately lifted me up and took me to a place and he showed me this tremendous, ferocious and vicious beast. And from where the Lord had lifted me up, I could see very clearly the beast he had lifted me up above. So I could see the beast from below. And uh, this beast at first, when I looked at him, I thought he was a lion. And I said, description of him, which I still still see now, uh, is lightish brown, as if coming to creamish or yellowish cream. And uh, at first I thought he was a lion. And then when I saw the other heads, at that moment I thought the lion would be small ones. Only to realize later that he was actually as I looked at him further, I saw he was a huge beast that has seven heads, and then he has horns on the heads. And uh, as I saw him lying there for some time, and then all of a sudden, I saw this tremendous woman that appears. And uh, in that conversation, at that time, in this vision, I almost rebuked her. I almost rebuked her because I wanted to tell her, to warn her, that look, the beast will hurt you. But she went to him. And I saw 
that where the beast was lying, the beast, upon seeing her, he lay in a way as to enable her. I could see that the beast was responding to her appearing there. And then they greeted each other because the beast raised forth his hands, his four, the four legs, and uh, to, to greet her, and they greet, the, the lady took forth her hand, uh, the woman took forth her hand and greeted the beast. So the beast, take, it was such an amazing uh, sight to behold. The beast takes his hands to greet her, she takes her hand to greet the beast, so the beast lifts his front legs and touch her hands where, where the beast was lying, touch, greet her. So that was very astonishing to see. And then, later I realized that actually the beast had lay in that form in response to her appearing to enable her to sit on him. And that's when I saw the woman sit on the beast. The beast that is a huge leopard, a huge, huge leopard, just the moment I realized he was a huge leopard and uh, a huge, huge leopard, but I had thought he was a lion at one point until I saw the many heads, the many leopard heads. And then she sat on him, and after she sat on this beast, then the beast now stood up. So then I understood that the beast lay there upon seeing her in a way as to respond to her, to enable her to greet him and then sit on his back to ride him. So it was a tremendous thing to see, a very fearful situation to see this woman sitting on this beast. And then uh, now I can speak a little bit more on what I saw. At the side, on the right-hand side of the beast, as the beast was now facing away from me, uh, with the woman sitting on the beast, on the right-hand side of the beast, I see two linens. And uh, I see very, very rich garment, rich garment, and that garment is uh, purplish, very rich purplish with strips actually has large strips, large stripes or strips of uh, uh, the, the, the beautiful purple, extremely beautiful in the context of this world, beautiful purple garment, and then, and then uh, has those strips, the intercalating strips, the strips in between that I thought were red. Those strips are actually scarlet. I've just realized that is scarlet. Scarlet is like red. So those strips have now understood they are scarlet. Again, the garment, two garments, not one. There are two pieces of garments that were down on the right hand side of the beast and the woman on the beast. And, uh, the, the, the garment, the two pieces, two pieces of garment on the right hand side. Uh, of the beast and the woman, and this powerful, what would appear in the context and definition of this world, a beautiful purple garment, very, very fine garment, really fine, fine textured garment, fine linen, so to say. And, uh, and the, that purple is actually stripped. So you see the strips, the long, large strips of, of red, but that red now I understood is actually scarlet. So there are two pieces of garment, it's not one. And so she, that, that's what the woman takes and wraps herself on. And once the beast and the woman were now aware that I have seen them, and once the Lord was aware that I have gotten the description the understanding and the description of this beast. I have seen him, and I have seen the woman that is on him. 
Then at that moment, uh, the beast again went down and the woman disembarked from the beast. I think that is the point at which the Lord really wanted me to engage and develop a confrontation and encounter with, uh, with this beast and the woman. So the, 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 the beast at that point uh, went down, lay down again to enable the woman because I said he's a huge beast, to the woman to disembark, to come off his back. And uh, that is when that woman came to me. The Lord now sends that woman to me, and she confronts me. And then I speak with her. And uh, first of all, I realize that I can describe a few more details now. Number one, th- there is this sense of aura that she has even though I knew that I have authority over her in this vision, that, again, I'm going to time her at one point and strike her. But when she came, I I realized the Lord made me know that she has this authority, this uh, this, uh, awe around her, and uh, she is very skinny. She's very skinny and very tricky, and uh, she, she, she engaged with me. We talked a bit, and uh, and and then she. I realized her tricks because I knew her tricks. I realized that uh, she has another agenda. She's she's the persona, the personification of the wickedness of the devil, Satan. That I understood very well, and so. The, the, the Lord allows me to, to engage with her and play smart and be very careful with her. But uh, I'm now describing a little bit more, a little bit of more detail on the encounter with this woman after she embarked from the beast. And uh, I realize she has a trick. There is, she has come with a plan. And, and the way she's now dressed when she comes to me is different from the way she's dressed while she's on the beast. Because now the two pieces of garment she has left again on the right-hand side of the beast, she has come this way. Now, she wears a pair of trousers. She's slim, and her face is a little bit slim, uh, with a little bit of a long nose, longer, the usual, but longer nose, pointed nose, so to say. And uh, she, I can still see her now. The, the, the upper piece of the way she's wearing, like her blouse is white, and then uh, the trouser is black, but sleeky black, like silk or linen, or, but shiny, very, very glossy, and very tight trouser, extremely tight, and she's very slim, and she's kind of slim, and uh, it's a black trouser, like these stretchers, the trousers that are stretchers, only that uh, it, it, it's a little stronger than a stretcher, and uh, it's black, and it's very shiny and glossy, has a sheen, a very strong sheen that shines, I still see it right now. And uh, her, her upper piece, the blouse, is, uh, is white. She's wearing white, and then her hair is black hair, and it's very straight hair, so it's prepared, she has prepared paired it very straight. She has really stretched it as uh, as though she has used uh, uh, what the women, the equipment the women use for their hair to straighten every strand of her hair. So her hair is really from the for, from the face, the, the fore part of the head, all the way going back is straight, long hair that reaches almost, I can see, up to half the back. And, uh, and, uh, So she engages with me, and I'm aware that uh, she's very tricky. She has another agenda. She, the agenda of the devil. She's evil, and she's deadly. But now, the most important thing that comes out of that is the Lord now makes me in that encounter know that she's very deadly. She's very deadly. She can kill. And I knew in that dream, in that that vision, so sorry, in that vision, the Lord makes me know that I had so much authority and power to strike her. I had so much authority to strike her. I could strike her, but I was waiting for a moment to strike her. So the Lord allows me to play it smart, to play smart with her. 
as though yes, it's okay, try to agree with her, but then time her and strike her at, at, at her when, when she's least expecting. That, that the Lord made me know that at one point I'm going to play it smart with her and when she's not expecting, I'll strike her for, for her evil and wicked plans. But what she does is what the agenda of her mission is because I see her now, uh, she, she tries to take the, the, the people of God. She tries to take me now towards the beast. So as she talks with you, she talks with you, she has one agenda. She walks with me, she walks with me, and then, then she, she has this enormous uh, power also around her, but the power that the Lord had placed on me was higher, much higher than the power she bewailed. So um, at that time, but you could see that she was drawing me towards the beast. So after that, uh, she goes back to the beast. Then she goes back to the beast, you see. Yes, she now goes back to the beast, meaning her coming, her disembarking from the beast, her coming to engage with me. Of course, the Lord does that to introduce her to me, as he did all the other uh, personalities of this hour including the horsemen and the riders, we normally bring them com close to me, also for identity and for confrontation and uh, for understanding. And then she's done. Uh, once she's done engaging with me and I timed her, I set out to time her and strike her. And then I see her go back to the beast. She goes back to the beast and she picks the garment again very Beautiful in the sense of this world, very, very expensive in the context of this earth, the world, very, very expensive linen, very, very exotic and truly expensive. Uh, and uh, I think it's, again, it's purple, but has stripes, those large, large stripes, when you stretch out your middle of it and you have a level of large stripes uh, that were running across the purple linen. A beautiful setup, really beautifully in the sense of this world, set up. And uh, she gets the garment again and she's on the beast again. But this beast is a huge leopard. It's a tremendously shocking huge leopard that I have not seen before. Now, this, uh, there are other aspects that develop. The second day, the Lord comes to advance this conversation. And this advancing of the conversation on June 3rd, uh, the Lord now uh, shows me what happens at that time. Now, I see that woman, she comes and she engages in sexual immorality. She's engaging in, in, in extreme sexual immorality. And I see it all. So I see her engaging in the, uh, some... some and a horrible form of sexual immorality, and uh, there is this asking. I see her in the, in the, in the, also including in the, in the bathrooms in sexual immorality. I see the water that's flowing from the, from, uh, the shower, and, uh, and then uh, she's asking, where is the large bathroom, the, the end suite, the suite, the presidential suite? So she's asking, and there are people there that she's talking to, and so... But when she get, engages, in sex, engages in sexual immorality, this is what I see. I see the humiliation of men. Yes, she, she humiliates men because I see that uh, it, it's like the men are now naked and they are kind of, uh, in their nakedness, they are attracted to her. So the Lord allows me to see all this. It's, she does, there's a bit of a whole tempest that she does there. Because I now see the men are naked, and uh, in their nakedness, they are kind of inflamed for her. They, 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 are, they are drawn to her. That is the kind of situation that develops there. And then these are leaders. These are the people. These are leaders. These are senior people. And then I see her even at the streets. Even in the streets, she's engaging with them. Then I see her also engage with some Israelites. Yes, the Jewish people, uh, in this kind of immorality. I see her enter this very interesting shop, uh, where she's, uh, it's a very wealthy shop. I think it's a jewelry shop, very wealthy jewelry shop. 
So she's engaging there too. She's engaging in there. She walked in there. This wealthy man he was wearing a red shirt and, uh, you know, he's very wealthy. So takes her up. And again, she engages in immorality. She's so promiscuous. She engages in extreme immorality, abhorrible immorality, sexual immorality. And then, but what amazes me is this. Uh, I, I don't know the exact setting of time, the chronology of these two sections that I'm trying, I'm revealing right now. Either before she engages, looks more like before she engages into this. Because at one point I see her engaging sexual immorality in the streets. And also in rooms, what, the blankets, the bed sheets. I see everything she's engaged in. And then she walks into this very expensive shop and also there she, she, they, they are engaged in immorality with her. But an event takes place. So it looks to me like an event takes place before, before she engages into this promiscuity and, uh, and immorality. Either at the beginning of her engaging into it or before, but an event takes place. At that moment, then I see the person of the Holy Spirit descend from heaven. And as the person of the Holy Spirit descends from heaven, he came like a glorious dove. A powerful, white, glorious dove this time around. And he came, heaven opened and he came all the way from heaven. And then I see at that moment, then he snatches away some people. He takes some people. It was such amazing because the Lord lifted me above the earth. Now I'm in the clouds and I can see the, uh, the earth. I see the landscape. And it's amazing because when that event takes place, it's more like uh, when one enters an aircraft and an aircraft takes off from, from the airport and then the pilot or the captain at that point turns the aircraft as you've just taken off like this and then it begins to turn the aircraft to get his bearing and flight path. And so you see the way the entire earth almost tilts from the aircraft. You see as though the entire earth tilts. So that is the moment at which again now, let me repeat this. This is very important part now that I reveal today. When this woman has come into sin, and uh, I don't know whether it was slightly before or she, right from the beginning of her coming into the sin, I see heaven open. And then the person of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, the person of the third person in the Trinity, the triunity of God, the Trinity of God, the Holy Trinity, comes from heaven, and this time he comes as a white, glorious dove. And when he comes, and the Lord makes him shake his wings and as he comes, so I can see very clearly his descent. He comes as a white, glorious dove, and when he comes, he, he, he takes the church. He takes the church. Again, let me repeat this. He takes the church. He, 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 he takes some people. He takes some people. And as I go with those people, the Lord allows me to experience what they experience. It was so amazing from what the Lord did because he lifted me to a place I could see uh, from where they were being lifted. There is a lift off. Lift off. So he takes people and as he lifts off some people, then it is as though one has just entered an aircraft and that aircraft takes off from a runway. And at the point when the pilot, you have just taken off and the pilot turns the aircraft to get his bearing in order to enter into his flight path. So you see at that moment as though the earth normally tilts a bit. I mean, if you are in the aircraft. So that is the feeling I saw. That is what happened. Then I saw he really took them, and he took them all the way up, up to the place where they arrived. And then that event took place in that form. So there is this event also that the Lord has now allowed me to talk about. As the Lord speaks to me about the coming of this very fearful, dreadful beast, the beast that is, uh, that is, uh, like a leopard, a huge leopard, a huge, I even see him now, as I speak, I still see him, a huge leopard, and then he has seven heads, 
and uh, he has horns. And uh, when he looks at when when he looks at this, when he sees this woman coming towards him, he prepares himself by lying down so that she may be able to embark to climb on his back. But when she arrives there, I see the two garments on his right, uh, the, the 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 purple with red stripes, which are now scarlet. I found out that is scarlet, and then prepares himself for her to embark to climb on his back. But then he greets her with a hand. He takes the four legs and greets her. She, she extends her hand also and greets the beast. And then the beast, the Lord unleashes, releases the beast to come and meet me. So a confrontation took, takes place. And I know that I have authority to strike the beast. I have power to strike the, to strike the beast and strike this woman. And I also know that when she comes to me, she comes in a very skinny way. She's very crafty. She talks, you know. Very seductively, she she has a trick. She's a liar, and she's lying. She's trying to win people. She, but I knew the Lord makes me know that she has a very evil agenda. But she, most importantly, there is this great fear that uh, she creates. She creates fear uh, so that you you realize you're caught up in an awe, or one is caught up in an awe and buys into one buys into her. That that's the whole thing. And then after she, the Lord brings to introduce her to me, and I see that she's wearing a white top, a very tight trouser, black, glossy, and then uh, the white top is also very fine. I see it's very, very fine. And her hair is black hair, totally, completely black, and she has made it very straight, fold up to half the back, half of the back, down there at the back, straight strands of hair, very glossy. The trousers is glossy, the white is glossy, and then she's walking, as uh, she's trying to talk to me, and the purpose is to draw, to draw me to the beast, and then after that, yeah, so she goes back and takes the garment again to wear, but another event takes place, which I don't want to classify, that event is either in terms of the chronology of the event, within this vision, this event either took place before the woman appeared, or takes place when the woman disappears, or during her appearance. But that event looks like takes place either before, again, before the woman appears. Then I see as though it, it appears before the woman appears. And that event is when all of a sudden I see the white, glorious dove, the person of the Holy Spirit, now lift people take some people, it was such amazing. They were taken as though in an aircraft. I mean, rather, I'm saying, the feeling of that liftoff when the person, the third person of the Trinity of God, the God, the Holy Spirit, the triunity of God, the Holy Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, now lifts some people and the feeling is as though you were in an aircraft when it hits the runway and takes off, and the pilot immediately turns the plane. So you always see as if the land, the, the soil, the land, the earth, is tilting as you are in the aircraft. So this event takes place. So th this is the kind of conversation that the Lord is having with the church now, the prophecy that he is releasing to the house of the Lord. Uh, this is the tremendous prophecy that the Lord has now sent me to speak to the nations of the earth and it's amazing uh, what this prophecy brings how this prophecy now changes um, the, the, the dynamic of the events in the church and uh, it's so amazing because this past night now the Lord now shows me the group of pastors yeah, a group of pastors now, they were in the fallen church. Yes, some are still in the fallen church, and then they begin to talk. Now, they talk with me this past night in the advancement of this conversation. Now, these pastors uh, speak to me about uh, the, the wine they have been drinking. Yes, so they are talking so much about the wine they have been drinking and so forth, the wine they are drinking this past night in advancing this conversation 
and they confess to me on the deeds also, the immoral acts that they have been involved in. Uh, so there was this whole conversation now with the priesthood this past night, and I see they are all races, I see the white pastors, I see the other races too. This is the prophecy that the Lord is speaking to the nations now, and is speaking it now to the entire earth, to the entire globe at uh, this hour. And uh, I can see very clearly that uh, this is yet another demarcation of a time point within the prophetic timeline of the Lord, the God of Israel, Jehovah, the God of heaven, the one and only creator of all men. And uh, now, the appearance of this, this personality here, this very uh, shocking personality of the woman who is uh, wearing this uh, very scarlet, actually purple, purple and scarlet mixed together, and red, which uh, later I found out is scarlet. And this woman is sitting and riding the beast. Now, this is very interesting. This is a very significant conversation that the Lord has now brought in into play within the whole picture of the zero countdown to the end of time, to the coming of the Messiah, and to the end of the age, the end of time. And I think this now speaks a very tremendous volume, a very unbelievable volume uh, into the mix of the prophecy, the different prophecies that have defined the timeline towards the return of the Messiah and the end of the age. And now uh, you can see very clearly that uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, the Lord speaks very clearly about this woman. And before we read that, before I read the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 17, where the Bible now talks about this vision the Lord has presented to me. There are few things, probably, few points that, you are, are, that are very important, that is important to raise here. And uh, the fact that, first of all, this beast, has actually been spoken about in the Bible. The Bible speaks about this beast as one of the personalities that appears towards the end. And uh, that, that personality also acquires a symbolism, acquires a symbolism, a biblical symbolism. And uh, it's also important to understand that this woman, the way the Lord presented the woman, she had so much power and influence, though I knew that I had greater power, but that's now from my side, but, but you could see that she wields quite a bit of authority and influence, and uh, she rides on the beast, and uh, key among the things that we may want to know is that uh, she actually kills millions of people, yeah, she, she, she brings to death millions of people. That's why you see when she was speaking with me, then she tries to bring me to the beast. So she she is used to kill a lot of people, mm. millions of people, of God's people, God's holy people, the true church of Christ. Mm. And I think that would be very important for us to understand, especially on time, but also the dynamic of her agenda, her mission at this time. Why the Lord speaks about her now? Why the Lord brings her into being, I mean, the prophecy to be spoken for realization? Why at this hour? And so, in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, it says very clear, clearly here, it comes up very clear. Verse 1, it says, One of the seven angels 
who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters, plus two, with her the king of the earth committed adultery that I saw. And uh, there's another thing I saw here. She was preparing, she was preparing some something here and putting. And then talking to me on my left here, she, she, she prepared some stuff at the time when she was involved in a lot of that adultery and that immorality. Then at one point she appears on my left and she was at a place that looked like a window counter and she was preparing something in a cup there. There was a cup there. I thought there were flowers, but she was preparing something in that cup. And then with, the, with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Now again, this night I have this conversation with the pastors and they're talking about their drunkenness and drunkardness on the wine they were drinking in the advancing of this conversation. Verse 3, Revelation 17. He says, The angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Again, this is now the name that's written. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony unto Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. The angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides. Hallelujah. Which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come, come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written, in the book of life, from the creation of the nation, from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind of wisdom. Again, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits, they are the seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the, others, and, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was, and now is not, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Verse 12. The ten horns you saw are, are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. 
they wage a war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. The angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, languages, nations and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Verse 17. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's word words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of earth. That is Revelation 17. And with all the mystery and all the in-depth uh, revelation that is embedded in this scripture, the key thing that I would like to raise here to the Church of Christ world over is probably verse 15. And then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So you see very clearly that uh, she comes, she comes to ruin the lives of nations, peoples, multitudes, and languages. So this woman comes on the agenda because she sits on the beast. She actually comes to bring the agenda of the beast. Of course, at the end, you see her destruction. In the deeper understanding of the symbolism, the symbols that the Lord is using, the symbolism that the Lord is using on this personality of the woman, the personality of the end time, this woman that now he has spoken to me about at this hour, the greater symbolism at times pursuing in, 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 in seeking the greater symbol that this woman represents you may lose out on the most important point, the, what the Lord is saying at this hour. The Lord is simply saying at this hour that, look, I have now brought into play this other personality of the end time. I am now speaking with my servant about the woman that wears this very fine linen that is very beautiful in the context of this world. It looks reddish, only to really scarlet, and uh, purple, and she sits on this beast, which is a huge leopard, another personality then, with seven heads and horns. So the key thing is that now that the Lord has spoken with me about this, then to the Church of Christ, the message is clear, the message is not ambiguous, the message is not hidden, the message is very clear that the Lord is saying that, look, Time is over. He's saying, look, I'm now engaging my servant on the conversation of the other side. And now, most importantly now, the Lord, to make everything easier for all, for everyone, never to say they never understood. He also shows me the taking away of the church, the rapturing of the church, the gathering of the saints, the snatching away of the saints. So, I think it's very important for the nations and the Church of Christ, the pastors, the priesthood, the congregations, world over, to understand that whether this woman shall represent a spiritual promiscuity, a church, a fallen church that will do things, that much I don't want to get involved in, a church that will develop alliance with these kings and commit adulteries with them, I don't want to go into that, because then we lose out on other people sometimes in describing this, the lowly people, that may see it as too complicated to understand. I'm saying that whether the symbolism that will come forth is that this woman will be the fallen church that commits adultery with several kings of this world, a compromise, and fights, 
fights against God's own true church. A form of global church that will fight God's true holy people, the true saints of God, God's true church. But that much I don't want to go into. But what I want to go into is now and before the taking away. Because you can see now the Lord again speaks about the snatching away of the church. And I think that's where the focus should be. That when they are taken up, he lifts me. I feel the lift off that they feel. Because I see the earth kills as though you are in a runway and the plane takes off. And immediately you take off like this. The pilot begins to turn the plane to pick his bearing on his flight path. And then normally you see as though the land is coming above you, like slightly tilting like this. So it makes me feel the taking away, the snatching away, and the lift off of the church. And then he shows me the person of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, as being the major, major instrument, the major uh, force, enabling power that snatches, snatches away the church. And so the nations need to prepare because really, really, time has gone. Time is over. And those who are wise, they will understand that there has been a relentless conversation, a non-ending conversation the Lord has engaged his servant on over time, again and again, repeatedly, about the coming of the Messiah. And uh, it's very, very important at this hour that in whatever activity the church gets involved in, the church should now center and make priority on the instruments, the requirements, the major standards and benchmarks that the Lord has set up over this entire conversation from when this ministry began. The benchmarks, the important uh, features of preparing, that is repentance, the zero tolerance to sin, the returning to righteousness, the return to holiness, the upholding of the whole year Christian the parking of the dross of sin, decay, apostasy, lies, deception, and the establishing of righteousness, the crystallizing of righteousness into the lives of the Christians, the, which, which of course I've said comes with an active, open, intentional, and deliberate rejection of wickedness and sin that now the church may prepare and not be caught up in a quagmire, in a situation where she has to grapple with the beast that is a huge leopard I have seen and has uh, seven heads and has horns and uh, this woman that is very seductive and very sly and very deceptive and that draws the multitude to be destroyed even though she too is destined for destruction but you can see that her agenda is to execute the agenda of the devil to be able to extinguish the holy people of God, the church of Christ, the true church of Christ. Again, the key word there is true. The true church of Christ, the holy people of God. And so it's, very, it's going to be very critical at this hour that uh, you understand that she comes to persecute she comes to persecute the church. She comes and, and, you see, with the drunkardness, you know. She is drunk with the blood of the saints, you see. That is a very important scripture that really underscores this entire conversation the Lord is bringing forth. And that scripture is in verse 6. In verse 6 he says, if I begin from 4, the woman was dressed in purple, and scarlet, Revelation 17, verse 4, I'm starting from 4, and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. I said, she held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abomination, abominable things, and the field of her adulteries. But that's amazing, because in that vision, at one point she appears on my left-hand side, as though at a window, at the window, uh, at the window, but um, uh, at, a, at a reception window, and I see her preparing some things and putting in a cup, which I thought was a, it was glittering, yeah, glittering. I almost thought it was glass, but it's a glittering cup, and I thought she was putting in flour, but now I understand what she was preparing in that cup. 
she held the golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. And then he goes on to say, verse 6, which is most important now for you, I saw the woman was drunk. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who had bore the testimony of Jesus. So when you read that, that right away tells you that it will be an intolerable time. This woman comes in to operate at an intolerable time, at a time when there is zero tolerance to God's holy people bearing testimony for Jesus, worshiping Jesus, reading the word of, the words of Jesus in the Bible, executing the agenda, the great commission of Jesus upon their lives. And these people will be killed. This is what he's talking about here. Because I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people and the blood of those who bore testimony unto Jesus. Even worshiping Jesus is bearing testimony unto him. Preaching Jesus is bearing testimony unto him. But you can see they have been persecuted and she has killed them. She has brought them to death. The devil uses her. The beast, the beast uses her to execute that agenda. And that's why in terms of the prophetic timeline, then you see that you as a believer and a Christian, you don't want to find yourself in this time when you have to be beheaded. Your blood has to flow. You have to be killed for actually worshipping Jesus. So now that we are still worshipping Jesus, then you know that the church is still bearing testimony, the true testimony of Jesus. But he's saying in this vision that he's speaking with me for four days now, he's clearly saying that a time is coming when there, it will not be possible to worship Jesus. But he's also saying that the true Holy Church of Christ will have been taken and then for anybody that will remain as part of the true holy church that did not go up, whose name was not written, you see, in the book. So anybody that will remain and then begin to confess and profess true Christianity after that taking away of the church will be, will have to face this woman, will be persecuted by this woman. I have seen the coming of the Messiah. I have seen the taking away of the church of Christ. And now the Lord speaks about events after the church is taken up. That is essentially what the Lord is speaking here. The Lord is speaking about events of persecution where there will be no worship because when the church is here, she will continue to worship. But then he's saying that within the great uh, abuse that will take place, the great tribulation that will take place, He's saying that at that time, there will be a lot of tremendous uh, difficulty in people to worship Jesus. It will be very difficult to worship Jesus. There will be a lot of persecution and bloodshed. People will die. They will be killed. Those that worship Jesus will be killed. Of course, we see little rudiments of that picking up right now on the earth where there is zero tolerance to the holy Christian living. The laws on homosexuality are now being established almost across, across the earth as the order of this day. And uh, holy living is thrown out of the window. Christians have compromised and named it. But he's saying in this vision, in a summary, that the church needs to prepare and prepare now and prepare well and be absolutely holy, and be absolutely righteous. And that the church needs to turn away from this decay of the love of money, the compromise with apostasy, lies, deception, malpractice, that the pulpit now needs to get its acts together, that they need now to leave that true Christianity with which they were commissioned at the cross upon which Jesus was crucified and resurrected that that true religion of the cross and the blood 
is the message of repentance that ought to have been, again, like I said, to have been ingrained in her salvation, crystallized, the fiber of her salvation, crystallized into the salvation of the present Christian. Because now the Lord is speaking to his servant, and the servant he speaks with, he is speaking with him now about the events when the church is taken already. He is speaking about the taking of the church, and I think that is the most important takeaway message today. That the man of God is saying, he has seen the Lord take away the church. And he has seen the glory of the Lord take away the church. In the book of Matthew chapter 11, I am now reading here, Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. In fact, verse 9 and 10. And then he says the following, verse 10. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And when you go into the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 40, again, Isaiah chapter 40, this is what you find written in the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, verses 1 to verse 5. But verse 3 is going to be our target. Isaiah 40. This is what he says now in Isaiah 40. He says, Comfort, comfort my people. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse 3 is the target here. He says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 4, Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of Jehovah, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, it's very important to understand that the entire earth that all the nations to understand for the entire church of Christ for all the church of Christ globally to understand that the Messiah is coming and John the Baptist has spoken with me about the coming of the Messiah the precious glorious mighty Lamb of God and that the mouth of the Lord has indeed spoken today.